be seated. Hallelujah. So again, we are on our last sermon for Rise Up sermon series. This is part seven, and this is called the underdog principle. Amen? The underdog principle. Some of you saw the little uh, graphic on uh, Facebook, and it brought back some memories maybe. Um, some of you looked at it and didn't know what it was, so that's all an age thing right there. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So last week we discussed how every Christian is called to represent the king and his kingdom in the earth. And we're talking about God there. Amen. We talked about the difference between God's kingdom and this world's system. And that we're called to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And this means pressing into God's word and getting truth from God's word. Amen. And that, wor that truth from God's word, it changes our minds. It renews our minds to the kingdom of heaven, and that's what we need. We need to be renewed to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we're called to be transformed, right? When we're transformed, after that we're transformed, that same scripture verse in Romans 12, 2 says that it's at after we're transformed that we are able to prove God's will in the world, amen? And so we take that word, that truth that's transformed us, and we share it with the world around us. And that shares God's will to the world around us so that God, so that the world can know God's will. Amen? So this series is talking about Christians and the church as a whole rising up and representing God in His kingdom and impacting the world around us. It's a very important message for all of us. It's a very important message for the church. And it's important for us to understand how God uses His people to carry out His big picture plan in the world. And... Um, I don't know if we all know this today, but God has chosen you to be a part of His plan in the earth. Did you know that? That we are all part of God's plan, and He wants to use us in that plan. Hello. You out there? See, many people in the church, they'll point to other people around them because they view that this person over here, that person's the person that God wants to use, or this person's the God wants to use, but it's the person that's staring you in the mirror that God wants to use, amen? And we really need to get a hold of that. We really need not to um, put that responsibility on everybody around us, but fail to take that responsibility on ourselves, because God has called us into this, and it's a wonderful thing, um, Today, I need us to understand that every Christian has been called to make an impact in the world around them. And, and this underdog principle, we're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 29. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29 says this, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. I don't know about you, but this is talking about me. And I don't know where you're at with God, but somebody should be getting happy about now because this means that all of that time that you thought you were disqualified for service in the kingdom, that the very person that you are is who God uses to advance His kingdom. Do you understand that today? Say this with me. Say, I qualify for service in the king's court. You see, because God uses the weak, the foolish, the lowly, and the despised. God loves to use the underdog to accomplish His plans. What is an underdog? An underdog is a person or a group who is largely expected to lose. Uh, another definition was a person of low social status. You've been written off. You've been forgotten about. That's an underdog. Nobody expects you to do anything good. <laughs> I 
Maybe they've even told you so. Maybe they've even told you that you'll never amount to anything. Maybe they even told you that you'll never accomplish your goals. Maybe they told you all kinds of things to let you know that they felt like you were the underdog. You were the wrong person at the wrong time and that you will never amount to anything. And I'm just here to tell you today that you're the very person that God loves to use to advance His kingdom. God loves the underdog. Why? He says He uses the underdog so that nobody will be able to boast at how great they performed and or how much they accomplished. When God uses the underdog, they're just as surprised as everyone else around them that God moved. Hey, listen, I know this. This is for real. They know that it didn't happen because of them. They know that unless God intervened, nothing that happened would have happened. That's humility, amen? And God prizes humility. I've told you before that I've never been more than average at anything that I've ever done in my life. And that if anything good ever happens in or through this church, that I can assure you that it has nothing to do with me. And this is a true statement. It's a true statement. Um, there are times when I'm at the church here by myself, when I just walk through the building and, and cry at the fact that God orchestrated everything needed to happen for us to be in this building right now. Trust me when I tell you that we could not have done this on our own. There's no way. God is the one who's building this house. And unless He builds the house, the laborers labor in vain who build it. This is one of the Scripture verses that I declare over this church on a regular basis. Unless God builds the house, the laborers labor in vain who build it. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by His Spirit. Faithful is He who calls us, and He is doing it. These are things that I'm declaring because God is the one who's doing it. And when we put our trust in ourselves, when we put our trust in ourselves, we put limits on God. When we put our trust in God, we take the limits off of God and we take the limits off of our own lives because God can do exceedingly far more abundantly more than we can ask or think. Amen? And so it's better to get our eyes off ourselves and our eyes onto Him. Amen? Exodus 3.11, listen to what Moses said. See, here's the thing. God loves to use underdogs to accomplish His plans in the earth. We already said that, right? Did you know that Moses, who God used to bring all of Israel out of bondage, murdered someone before God called him? He killed a guy before God called him. Can God still use him? Is that okay? I don't know. It also talks about, if you read the Scriptures and you study it out, most, most Bible scholars believe that Moses had some sort of a speech impediment. And he basically refused when God called him and said, no, God, not me. I can't do this. Choose somebody else, Moses said. <laughs> right? He was an underdog. He wasn't the typical person that you would think to choose to do what God was doing, to set free millions of people from hard labor. That's what he was calling Moses to do. And to go to the most powerful man on the face of the earth at the time and to tell him to let God's people go. Moses didn't think that would turn out too well. See? Listen to what he said when God called him. Exodus 3.11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? See, some people might have said, it's about time, God. You know, I've been waiting for you. Come on, use me somehow, right? 
But most underdogs, most underdogs say, who am I that I should be used by God? Lord, are you sure? You sure you know what you're doing? You sure you got the right person here? God, how am I going to do what you're talking about? But Moses fought through these things. God helped him. Moses fought through all of these distractions and became an all-time heavyweight chain breaker in this earth. Amen? What I mean by an all-time heavyweight chain breaker is millions of people were set free because he stepped out in obedience. Amen? He became a chain breaker for the Lord. How many people would love to walk in intimacy with God to a place where when they saw somebody in bondage, whether it's to addictions or to any type of sin, that you saw people that were in bondage, that you could go and God could use you in those people's lives to bring freedom. Amen? How many people would like to be a chain breaker in the kingdom of heaven? Amen? I would. I know that. I would. I want to see people's lives touched and set free by the power of God. Amen? And Moses was a chain breaker. It didn't look pretty at the beginning. He even said, no, Lord, find somebody else. But God persisted and Moses worked through. We need to surrender to God and to His plan for our life. Again, millions of people released from hard labor in Egypt, and God's plan moved forward because Moses was obedient. Here's the first lesson of being an underdog. We need to have more faith in God to bring us into His plan for our lives than we have fear of messing it up on our own. Amen? We can't talk ourselves out of God's plan. And I think that a lot of times as Christians, we talk ourselves out of God's plan. Because God's plan is always going to be greater than our ability to fulfill it. And so if we're putting our trust in ourselves, then we're going to be talking ourselves out of that plan. And the reason why we're talking ourselves out of that plan is because our eyes are on us instead of on God. Because if our eyes were on God, then we would trust Him because we know that there are no limitations to God. There's nothing that God cannot do. And so if God called you to it, He'll bring you through it. Amen? And so we need to get our eyes off ourselves, and we need to get our eyes on God. That's a number one rule of being an underdog. It's not about us. It's about Him. And God is able to bring us into the plan that He has for us. We need to keep meditating on God's promises. We need to keep studying out God's Word in our lives. We need to be careful not to be paralyzed with fear and inactivity when hearing God's plan for our lives. Because I'm telling you, this plan that God has for your life, it's it's greater than you. It's above and beyond what you're able to do every single time. Because if God gave you something you were able to do, it wouldn't take faith to do it. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So God wants you to step into this plan, even though it's far beyond your ability to accomplish it. I'm telling you, we wouldn't be sitting in this building right now, right, if the leadership stayed in a place of fear over numbers. I'm telling you, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. Many people have been paralyzed with fear and inactivity. They've been called by God, but they haven't taken the appropriate steps to carry out His plan in their lives because of fear, doubt, and unbelief, right? These are the enemies of the underdog. I want to ask you today, seriously want to ask you, and I want you to think about this, what is the Lord calling you to do for His kingdom? Because if you call yourself Christian, there is something that God has for you to do. There is a plan that God has for your life if you call yourself Christian. What sphere of influence that we've talked about those seven spheres of influence in this series, what sphere of influence is God calling you into? Maybe one, maybe more than one. What is He calling you into? How does He want you to impact the world around you? If He is calling you again to it, He will bring you through it. Sometimes the underdog has faith in God's plan, but the people around them. So this first one that we looked at with Moses, right, it was his own lack of faith in himself, you know, for God to do this through him because his eyes were on himself, right? So that was the first thing. 
We got to need to get our eyes on ourselves and our eyes on God and trust that He has the ability to bring us into those plans. Amen? That's Moses' problem. Some people that are underdogs, they have spent some time with God and they have faith to step in to the plan that God has for them. But other people around them, <laughs> discourage them with words. And some of them are people that love those people, but they see what the plan is that God has for life, and they don't know that it's the plan that God has for life. They think they came up with this on themselves, and they're saying, you can never do this. Well, they're right. They couldn't never do this if God didn't tell them to do it. But if God's telling them to do it, then they can do it. Amen? And so David was one of those people. This happened to David. People around them, around him, were discouraging him, right? He was the youngest brother of Jesse's family, and so Jesse's sons, he was the youngest, tending sheep for his father. His father asked David to deliver food to his brothers. Three of his brothers, the oldest brothers, were in the army of Israel, and so David was asked to go deliver food to them. And when David arrived, he heard that Goliath was challenging the army of Israel and that nobody was volunteering to fight him. Nobody inactivity, seized with fear, unable to advance the kingdom because there was a giant in the way. How many people listening to my voice right now are failing to advance God's kingdom because there's a giant in the way? This was the army of Israel, the entire army of Israel Nobody would volunteer to fight this man. And I don't know if you know the the tradition there, but those were the representatives that would come out and fight, and that was what you could do. Instead of the whole armies coming to fight, you could send out a representative, and those two representatives would battle. And whoever won that battle, they would take over the other army. And so this isn't just talking about one man against one man. This is talking about the fate of Israel. And not one soldier in the army of Israel would stand up to this giant and fight him. Look, 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 25. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man comes out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. And still nobody was stepping up. David asked the men standing near him when he heard this, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This is a young kid, right, coming in. And, and just so you know, when Samuel, went, Samuel was giving, giving instructions to go and, and, and to, to the family of Jesse and, and to call forth his sons before him, that God wanted to anoint one of those sons as king, right? And so all of the sons passed before Samuel, and Samuel looked at all of the sons that Jesse brought and passed before him, and, and, and Samuel said, I don't know what's going on. It's none of these. Do you have another son? Well, guess what? David was out in the fields. His father didn't even think to bring him in and pass him before Samuel. And, and, and all of these men that were the, David's brothers, they were all big and, and good looking, and they were, they, they were ones that you would choose. But God says, I don't choose by outward appearance. I choose by the heart. Amen? I choose by the heart. And so he knew that even though all of these men, Samuel knew, they all passed in front of him. They all looked like they could be candidates to be king, but none of them were. Why? Because Samuel was listening to God. And and Jesse had to call David in from the fields. And David came in and Samuel said, he's there. This is him right here. This is the man I'm supposed to. And he was just a boy. But he was anointed as king. And then he went back out into the fields to take care of the sheep. Because there was a process that had to take place. And then he got called by his father, and he was supposed to take food to his brothers. And then he heard about Goliath threatening the armies of Israel and threatening the very nation itself. And he asked the men, what what will happen 
If we do this, verse 27, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Elab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking, listen to this, when his oldest brother heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. Now what have I done, said David? Can I even speak? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Right? Listen to this. Saul replied, this is the king. You are not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. This is the king. You hear all the negativity and the obstacles that David is facing. It would have been easy to start to question if this was God that had spoken to him. It would have been easy to start to agree with the, all of the talking heads around him. Have you ever been there where everybody around you has a plan for you, but it's not God's plan? Are you listening to everybody else around you, or are you staying focused on what God has called you to? It would have been easy for David to get sidetracked here. It would have been easy for him to drop the food and go home. But David was not going to allow God's army to be mocked by an uncircumcised Philistine. See, he had spent some time with God out there tending those sheep. He had gotten to know God. He had gotten to know who God was. He had gotten to be able to trust God in those fields. And he was different than all of those men in the army of Israel. So Saul told him he couldn't do it, right? Listen to David's response. 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Yeah, woo-hoo. Woo! Glory. I don't know who else is getting excited about that, but you should be getting excited about that. Amen? Because this is the heart that God wants every single one of us to have, to spend time with Him, to get in a place where we're more confident in God than fearful of the giant. Amen? This is the place where God is calling us to come to. What are the giants in your life? What are the giants intimidating you? What are the things eating your lunch? What are the things bringing oppression and depression into your life? God wants you to get so familiar with Him and so familiar with His Word that you're not intimidated any longer, but that you have the power of God in you and you have faith in that God. Amen? Amen. This is what God is calling us to. We should get excited as we read these things. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, both of them, because he is, def- your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. This is faith in God, Amen. Right in the midst of all of the things going on. That's faith in God. That's stepping out in faith. Sometimes it feels like you're stepping out into a death trap. Sometimes it feels like you're stepping out into a situation that you cannot win. Sometimes it feels like you're stepping out into something that is just greater than yourself. That's faith. That's faith. What did Saul say? King Saul to David. 
go and the Lord be with you. <laughs> Again, if God calls you to it, he'll bring you through. Goliath had a sword and a shield. David went out against him with a slingshot and some rocks. You know why? Because he knew it wasn't the slingshot and rocks that was going to give him victory. He knew that it was his God that was with him. Do you have faith in God? Do you have faith in God to win the battles that show up on your doorstep? Do you have faith in God to go forward with Him? Even when you seem to be ill-equipped and outnumbered, do you have faith in God? Did you know that He dropped Goliath dead with the first rock that was slung? Hit him right between the eyes. Little David rescued all of Israel that day. You notice Moses did the same thing. He rescued Israel from bondage. David just rescued Israel from bondage. Another chain breaker. When we step out with faith in God, he's going to direct that stone and give us the victory. Our God is the God of the impossible. And it's time for us to rise up and answer God's call. Lesson number two. For the underdog, once we have received direction from the Lord... I said, once we've received direction from the Lord, right? We cannot allow anyone around us to talk us out of it once we've received instruction from the Lord. Most people would have told us not to purchase this building. I talked about it before. To purchase this building for $1.2 million. They would have said it's not worth it, and they would have been right. It's not worth it. It's absolutely not worth it. However, God told the leadership to buy the building. So that presents a problem. We can either look smart in front of men or we can obey God. You see, sometimes we've heard all kinds of stories of God just gifting people these big buildings that they can come in. And, oh, glory to God, God, give us that building. God, woo! No. God doesn't do the same thing every time. Sometimes he does some things different, right? These other places, they got that building just plop right down in there. We have to trust God every single day. We have to trust God every single week. We have to trust God every single month. And God comes through every single time. Amen? See, the bank wouldn't loan us the money to make the purchase for this building. They only approved us for $650,000. Oh, game over. Guess we're done. God wasn't done. We only had approval for $650,000 to purchase this building. And so we couldn't get the money that we needed to purchase the building. It was beyond our ability to purchase this building. Do you understand that? It was beyond our ability to purchase this building. The bank wouldn't help us out. We didn't, obviously didn't have $1.2 million in our bank. It was a done deal. It was no, no, no go, right? Not for God it wasn't. God put it on the hearts of the people that owned the building to finance the building for the first five years, right? And so they stepped up and they financed the building for us for the first five years. As, you know, we're still in that five years, but they financed the building for us for the first five years. That's a big deal. I don't know if you understand that. It was impossible, but we're here. Amen? The door that wouldn't be open and the door that couldn't be open is now standing wide open. Amen? This is what has happened. It was beyond our ability, but here we are. There were so many things that God had to do for all of us to be here today for this to work out, and he did every single one of them. As I said, God made this happen. See, this past month, we just had an advisory board meeting. This past month, we had money to pay all of our bills, a full-time salary, two part-time salaries, utilities, uh, the mortgage, which is $8,500 a month on this building, the HVAC payments, the new signs on the building, all of the normal ministry costs, with an additional almost $7,000 left over at the end to put towards our next project. Amen? Yeah. I'm only telling us this today because I need you to see that what seems impossible to us 
is not impossible for God. Amen? And when we put it, when He speaks to us and we put our trust in what He speaks, God will move mountains to make it happen. Amen? He'll do it in your life. If God speaks to you and you step out in it, God will move mountains to make it happen. We are watching it happen now. Right? This isn't something from the past. This isn't something possibly in the future. This is happening right now. God is doing it. And every month, God shows up. And every month, God does it. And we're thankful for you guys. We're thankful for how God speaks to you and how you're obedient you are to step out in that. We know that we're, we're better together. Amen? We know that God is moving through all of us. And all of you are co-laborers in this harvest. Amen? We are a faith family. Again, once you hear from God, be like a pit bull on a T-bone steak and keep going after it and never let it go. God will move mountains again to bring it to pass. Don't let yourself be talked out of it by anybody. You see, that was the second one. The first one was don't talk yourself out of it. The second one, lesson of an underdog, was don't let somebody else talk you out of it. Amen? And we're going into the third one now. In order to do that, we've got to talk about Gideon. Gideon was another underdog in God's story. This is the last one we're going to hit. He had to be talked into God's plan for his life. If you've read that in Judges 6, God had to talk him into his plan <laughs> for his life. Isn't God so good? But once he was in, Gideon went all out. Amen? During this time, God's people were being oppressed and attacked by the Midianites due to their disobedience. Every time harvest time came around, the Midianites would raid the food supplies and leave Israel with nothing. And it happened over and over again, and they were very discouraged as a result of it. So much so that Gideon was hiding in the wine press, treading out wheat to hide it from the enemy. And he had an encounter with God. Judges chapter 6, verse 11. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Verse 13, pardon me, my Lord? Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Who's there right now? If the Lord is with us, why has all of this happened to us? Some people live there. It's a bad place to live. Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Now listen, he's been talking to the angel up until now. It's been talking about all about an angel talking to him, right? L look at verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Am I not sending you, 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 you? Am I not sending you? Is what God said to Gideon when he said, God has forsaken us. He's abandoned us. And God spoke up and said, haven't I sent you? You see, so God had already raised up. God had already sent an answer to the prayers. But sometimes you are the answer to your prayer. You just need to hear from heaven and step out in obedience because God wants to use you. God wants to use you to be the answer to that prayer. Haven't I sent you, is what he said. Haven't I sent you? We need to hear that. I believe God's speaking that to some of us, right? 
And then Gideon keeps going here in verse 15. Pardon me. He's real polite. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. My family's the weakest, and I'm the least in my family. I think that puts him at the bottom. And that's the point that he's trying to make. I'm at the bottom. How are you going to use me? Because God loves to use underdogs in his plan. (laughs) And he understands the baggage that goes along with that. And he can handle it. How can you use me? I am the lowest and the least. And the Lord answered, I will be with you and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. Is that enough, people? Is that enough? Is it enough for the Lord to be with you? Is it enough to accomplish what God has set before you? Is it enough for the Lord to be with you? Or do you need all kinds of other things to support you and to help you along the way? Or is it enough for the Lord to be with you? What can you do when the Lord is with you? My question should be, what can't you do when God is with you? So that was the answer to his question. Notice how Gideon is hiding from the enemy when the angel appears and calls him a mighty man of valor. Do you see how God doesn't speak to us where we're at, but calls us forth? He calls forth that potential on the inside of us and who he has created us to be. So he doesn't talk to us where we're at, but where he's, what he's created us to be and where he's created us to be. He speaks to the potential in your life, amen? Because he knows that what? Words are powerful. And so you need to come into alignment with how God sees you, not how you see you, not how the world around you sees you. You need to come into alignment with how God sees you. And the Bible is chalked full of who you are in Christ. And if you'll just grab a hold of who you are in Christ, God will be able to do great things in your life. But you got to get your eyes off of that place of how you see yourself, and you have to ask God. Just pray that prayer. God, how do you see me? And let Him speak to your heart. Let Him lead you through the Scriptures and show you who He sees you as. Because I guarantee you, it's not who you see. When the angel tells Gideon that the Lord is with them, Gideon asks that question, why has all this happened to us if the Lord is with us? Gideon goes on to tell the angel that God has abandoned them, right? And then we notice that the Lord answered him. And and he said that you're the answer to the prayer, right? So many times we're blaming God for our problems when God has already given us the answer. In this case, God says, I am sending you. Many times, again, you are the answer to the prayer that you're praying. How often has God spoken to someone to do something that they've failed to do? I love that in in, in that other sermon in this series where we talked about Esther and how Mordecai said to her, right? Hey, listen, you know, what if it is that you were born for such a time as this? What if you became queen for this very purpose? And he said, if you don't do it, God will raise somebody else up to do it. But he said, you're not going to get the blessing for it, and your family's going to perish. So God will raise somebody else up if you fail to step into it. But there's going to be consequences to that. What repercussions were experienced and how many lives were lost due to fear, selfishness, and a lack of obedience on people's part when God spoke and they didn't listen. God said to Gideon, again, am I not sending you? So I want to challenge us today. Might God be speaking this very same thing to you? Am I not sending you? Maybe you are the answer to the problem that you've been bringing before God's throne. Gideon responds, how can I save Israel? Again, weakest, lowest, right? And the mistake that he made is the one that we talked about earlier. He is judging God's plan for him based on his own ability rather than putting his trust in God's ability. There's a big difference. Again, it's not about him. It's not about us. It's not about you. 
How does God respond to Gideon, right? I will be with you, and that's enough. That was the answer. And God did amazing things in order to accomplish his plan through Gideon. He gave him instructions on what to do. 32,000 men gathered around Gideon. God told Gideon that there were too many men. Too many. If I give, them, if I give the enemy to you into your hands with this many, Israel will boast that their strength saved them. Too many. That's why God chooses the underdogs, right? God whittled this army down from 32,000 to 300. And he gave them a great victory over a much larger force. But it wasn't through might. It was through the wisdom that God imparted to Gideon. God did not just snap his fingers to give Gideon the victory. That's not what happened. God gave Gideon instruction. Are you listening to the Lord? Are you spending time in His presence? Are you asking Him for direction? God gave Gideon instruction. Gideon had to step out in faith to carry out God's instructions. And as usually with God, the instructions that were given were crazy. They were nuts. It didn't make sense. Going up, making a bunch of noise, clanking a bunch of... What? This is how we're going to defeat the Midianites? But they did it. They stepped out in faith. And I'm telling you, if you'll spend time in God's presence, let Him download things on the inside of you. What, hear what He's saying. Step out in faith in the things that He's telling you to step out in. God will do the rest. God will do the impossible. Amen? This is what happened to Gideon. See, there's a part that we play. God gave Gideon instruction. He stepped out in faith to carry out the instructions. As he stepped out in faith, God's plan, a supernatural victory, was won. Again, we play a part in God's plan. God loves to use the underdog to accomplish his plans. The lesson number three for an underdog is that faith-filled obedience brings forth breakthrough and victory. Faith-filled obedience brings forth breakthrough and victory. See, we talked about being ambassadors of Christ as if God was making his appeal to the world through us. See, there's a plan for your life. God desires to make his appeal through you. And so again, what realm of influence? Where does God want to do that with you? What realm of influence does God want you to impact around you? God gave you the people around you. God gave you the systems around you. God gave you the open doors so that you could step into them and make an impact for the kingdom. Church isn't about, Christianity isn't about coming to a building on a Sunday. I can't get over saying that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I'm sorry if you're tired of hearing it, but it's simply true. We need to get out of the church. We need to take God's presence outside of the church. We need to make an impact in the places we live. Amen? That is what Christianity is. That's what church is all about. Amen? Ambassadors for Christ. That's who we are. What specific plan is he asking you to implement to see a supernatural victory? If you don't know what that supernatural plan is, you simply have to spend more time in his presence. You simply have to ask him and then wait. And I know that's hard for some people to wait because there's so many other things that we have to do. But you got to shut yourself in, hear his voice, get instructions, and then step out in faith and see what God will do. In your life and through your life, a supernatural victory will be won. It's time to rise up and to step into your calling. It's time to make an impact in the world around you. It's time to be a doer of God's Word. It's time for the underdogs to rise up. Amen? Rise up, rise up, rise up, arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Amen? Arise and shine, arise and shine, arise and shine. Be a light to the world around you. Amen. Be the salt of the earth. Allow the people that you can come into contact with through the renewing of your mind. Allow them to know what God's will is. Impact the world. Impact the world. Impact the world for the king and his kingdom. Amen. And advance the kingdom throughout all the world. That is what we have been called to do. You are a Christian, a Christ follower. Now follow in his footsteps. 
He changed the world. And now it's your opportunity to step in and to agree with Him and partner with Him to see the world changed again and again and again and again through the power of the gospel that He's placed on the inside of His people. Arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen. Every single one of these men were underdogs when God called them. These men all had to overcome obstacles to fulfill God's calling on their lives. By God's grace, these men all pushed through the resistance and laid hold of the victory. As a result, they all impacted the world around them and furthered God's plans in the earth. What about you? Please get this. What about you? Are you going to sit back and go through the motions, or are you going to trust God, step out in faith, and become a chain breaker and a history maker for the king and his kingdom? See, you were born with a divine purpose. There's a plan for your life. The Bible says that before one of your days came to pass that God knew every single one of them, and he had them written down in his book. God has a plan for you. Amen. You're not a mistake. Let me ask you this. That plan begins when you step into the pages of that book that God has written for your life. So here's the question that I have for you. Have you surrendered your life fully to Him? I want to do two things this morning a little bit different. The Lord just put it on my heart to do this. We're going to pray to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior for whoever hasn't taken that step. If you've never taken that step, If you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and to become your Lord and Savior, to take over your life, if you've never done that and you've never surrendered to God, I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. The second prayer we're going to pray is people that have already taken that step, but you haven't fully given your life to God. You're holding on to different parts of your life, and you haven't stepped into the fullness of the plan that God has for you. I want to pray with you about that. And so let's go ahead and pray. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want a life filled with purpose, you want to know why you're here, today's the day for you to step into the pages of that book that God has written for your life. And the way that you do that is simple surrender. You just ask God to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and to be your Lord and Savior. So if that describes you and you want to take this step, I want you to repeat this prayer for me. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and search our hearts right now. And if this describes you, I want you to pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life completely to you. And I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of all of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. Lord, help me to live for you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer, God heard you pray that prayer, and everything that you've just asked, God just did. It's called being born again. It's called being saved. The Bible says to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become children of God. You are now a child of the living God. And as you go through this process of living this new life for Christ, you're going to have questions. There's a, there's a book that's coming up on the screen behind me called Now What? This book is available to everybody who prayed that prayer here in this sanctuary. It's in a basket right before you go out into the main hallway there. It's free of charge. Just grab one and go. Study it. It'll tell you what the next steps are for you now that you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you have any questions, there's a number on the back. You can text or call that number, and your questions will get answered. If you're listening online, we want to put this resource in your hand as well. All you have to do is put free book down in the comments section. We'll send one of these out to you. believe it'll be a blessing to you. Father, bless all those who prayed that prayer and received you into their lives today. Now, right now, there are some people in here. Let me just invite the uh, ministry team to come up right now. And as the ministry team's coming up, I just have a question for us today.
Are there any underdogs out there this morning? <laughs> God's excited for your life. But my question for you is, have you talked yourself out of God's plan for your life? Have you disqualified yourself through doubt and unbelief based upon your position in life? I want you to come up for prayer and encouragement today. Have others put you down and discouraged you from stepping out in faith? If that's the case, I want you to come up here and receive prayer today. Come on now. All you underdogs, arise. We're going to sing a song here in just a minute. And if you have any prayer requests whatsoever, I want you to get up here. There was uh, some prayer before church today, and uh, there was a feeling that there was somebody that would be here today that struggled with oppression or depression, and possibly even to the, to the degree that um, you don't want to live anymore, a suicidal spirit. And so if that's here today, if you're here today, and the enemy is attacking you with that, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's an attack of the enemy. It's not you. It's him coming at you. And so what you need to do is you need to come up here and you need to get prayer so that we can break that thing off of you so that you can experience that peace that we spoke of earlier today. And so we're going to sing this last song. And then pa Pastor Tim is going to close us in prayer after we sing this last song. So let's go ahead and stand to our feet and worship the Lord. And when you come up here today for prayer, come up in faith, believing that God is going to touch you and change your life. Amen?